We now bring you Dr. Kevin Boyd's presentation, already in progress. There are tiny children snoring. But today's study raises the question, could a pattern of noisy nights be linked to behavioral problems down the road, like attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, and could any of it be prevented with a good night's sleep? Snoring is actually a red flag. It is a hallmark for problem breathing at night. Today's study followed more than 11,000 children for seven years. Those who snored, breathed through their mouths, or had apnea, long pauses between breaths, were up to twice as likely to develop behavioral problems by age by age seven. So was anyone aware of this, that snoring in little kids is actually linked to um, ADD? Because this is flying under the radar of the medical profession. One person, I, that's one more than I usually get. And we've been doing this talk, I'm, I'm part of a consortium at NYU of physicians and dentists and uh, speech pathologists that are very much involved with this. Uh, it's very serious, this is brand new. Um, ADD is not a psychological disorder, it is a syndrome, a collection of symptoms that are centered around one central condition, which is sleep deprivation. Lots of kids are sleep deprived, and I'm going to uh, go into some definitions later, but let's move along. i got to do this in 25 minutes. Um, and what did I mean in my title, not likely things of the past? And I just malocclusion, which I will define as just the way the teeth and the jaws are misaligned, and it can be picked up as early as two years old, maybe even in utero. Um, and these ADD and, and sleep, uh, structured sleep apnea, these, these things are all connected. Um, this is, like I said, flying beneath the radar of the medical profession. Pediatricians are just now starting to learn about this. Um, certainly the dental profession is, is slowly coming on board. Orthodontists uh, are really going to be the people that are going to be the go-to people for this because this type of things that they do on older kids to make room for their teeth, if they do it in younger kids, they can make room for their tongue and their lower jaw, which brings it off the back of the throat and can improve this kid's, these kids' airway function, which has neurological implications. Um, so anyway, uh, ADD, you know, this is uh, typical. You know, it's not just a kid falling asleep in school. Um, when they're when they're sleep deprived, they don't act like falling asleep. This is a kid that is just super sleep deprived. But when they're just sort of chronically uh, sleep deprived, they react like us when we can't fall asleep at the wheel. We do the turn the air conditioner on, roll the windows down, turn the radio on. That's the way kids are when they're sleep deprived. Ritalin is caffeine. You don't, I, I drink a cup of coffee when I need to stay awake, but that's a wrong thing to give a child. It totally messes up the cause in the first place. It destroys REM sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is what kids need to consolidate memory for learning, to repair and, and, and restore their bodies from the damage that's done while they're awake. So Ritalin is awful. There's another way. And believe me, your local dentist is going to be in, in the options for treating kids with this. Um, I just was invited by the World Health Organization to give a talk on sleep deprivation in jaw and how it relates to the jaw and the way kids breathe. And uh, it was on obesity. And I'm not going to have time to talk about that today. But it does mess up the appetite regulatory peripheral neuropeptides like ghrelin that, that the previous speaker mentioned and, and leptin and cortisol which is tied to seeking out some really bad stuff uh, carbohydrates so i'm not going to talk about that so much but the sleep apnea and the add is what i really want to drive home today so again i'm just i, I don't want to belabor it but childhood obesity is definitely tied to this epidemic of sleep deprivation. It's way worse than, than is, it's flying under the radar of everybody, but things are changing. Um, these are the take home points that I gave uh, from the World Health Organization sponsored event in Aruba, where I also did some work for my uh, research that I'm doing in, in anthropology. Um, but, and I'm, I'm using the term paleo, I hope that's all right. I, I just, after hearing all the other speakers, I just thought, you know, I used to use ancestral, so I'm going to use the term paleo to describe the pattern of infant feeding that I feel 
explains why kids are having so many issues with the shape of their jaw and their ability to oxygenate their brains while they're sleeping. Um, jaw development uh, is dependent on challenge to the jaws, teeth, and face early in life. Uh, breastfeeding is a component of a paleotype regimen, which means the way that they're weaned. And weaned doesn't mean you're done breastfeeding. Weaning is a process. Fully weaned means you're done breastfeeding and you're just eating solids. And our ancestors did it for up to three or four years. That's an ancestral pattern that went on for millions of years and just stopped somewhere around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And that's when crooked teeth started and impacted wisdom teeth. Uh, so this is, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's so great to preach to a choir. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea uh, what I go through with my colleagues. Um, anyway, healthy sleep breathing is, is really what a, a wide forward jaw, I'm going to explain what that is and how you get one as early in life as possible, uh, lowers the risk for ADD help, because it promotes healthy sleep breathing. And the main thing I want you to take away from this, if you remember nothing else, is sleep is not a luxury, okay? And it's not just a mama sleep, but it's sleep architecture. And a couple other speakers have talked about it. Um, I've seen some graphs up there where paleo, you know, it talks about activity and diet, sleep. I, I mean, I saw it at least two or three lectures. So sleep hygiene, we call it. It's the amount of sleep and the architecture of how you cycle through sleep. And children cycle differently. They have to spend increasingly amount, uh, increasing amount of time in REM sleep throughout the night. That's, REM is what really builds their brains and it helps them pay attention. So anyway, this is when we talk about, uh, this is a hypnogram, uh, one speaker already talked about that, and that this area under the curve here, this is REM sleep, okay? The amount of time in REM has to uh, increase throughout the night. The gold standard for assessing sleep architecture is a polysomnogram, an overnight PSG we call it. And the kid has to sleep in the hospital. I'm the only dentist, the only pediatric dentist in Chicago that has been qualified, certified, to refer kids directly without uh, endorsement from a physician because I've been trained, I was taken with two other dentists to uh, Wash U Saint, in St. Louis, it's a medical school, and they trained us in sleep medicine assessment of what to ask parents and what to see in the face and the jaws of how we can deem a child at risk and order a sleep study. And I haven't missed one yet. I've probably referred 100 kids in the last year, and every one of them has a sleep issue. Some of them overt apnea. And, you know, the pediatricians, they don't get this in medical school. It's not their fault. Uh, but this is, you know, another paradigm shift. It's just like evolutionary biology. Nobody gets it. Nobody understands it. Uh, so it's all going to be about nasal breathing. All air is not the same. This is junk air. The air that you get through your mouth is like McDonald's use a food metaphor. This is paleo air, okay? This is how our ancestors breathe through their nose. Now how come? Why is nasal air better? And everyone would be able to say it filters, right? And the mouth doesn't do that. Well, it does some other things. Your air has to reach the alveoli of your lungs at 98.6. And unless you're in Atlanta in August, at 98, not 98.6, it's today. But unless you're somewhere where it's really hot, you're not going to, when you breathe through your mouth, you're not going to get 98.6 air and humidity. You know, the, the, the humidity of the body is nothing like ambient air unless you're in a tropical rainforest. So we need nasal air because it humidifies, it warms, it filters, and there's something called nitrogen oxide, not nitrous oxide, not laughing gas. It's one nitrogen, one oxygen. It resides dormant in the folds of the paranasal sinus complex. You've heard of turbinates, nasal turbinates. Turbine is the root word. How come? It speeds the air up. That catalyzes conversion of nitric oxide synthase. It's actually L-arginine. And that causes nitric, nitric oxide to be released. It is a powerful antioxidant. It is it's sterile, it relatively sterilizes the air. Nasally breathed air is relatively sterile kills a lot of bad stuff, but it also facilitates diffusion. It, it vasodilates and facilitates diffusion of oxygen into the blood to the brain. It's way better air, it's healthy air, it's quality air. 
and you don't have to breathe as hard to get it. People who only breathe through their mouth, or predominantly breathe through their mouth, they have to work real hard. Inflammation ensues with that. So this is all about nasal breathing, and that's another thing. I hope everyone takes that away from this. Um, this is where I'm at Northeastern Illinois University. They have a marvelous anthropology department there, and I'm taking undergrad classes uh, to qualify myself so I can turn my undergraduate thesis project that I'm proposing right now into maybe a PhD dissertation. Um, my advisor, uh, Lisa Davis, is a research fellow at the Field Museum and gave me access to the chimpanzee collection, over 100 years of Chicago zoos. And this is only a few animals that we saw, but it was so compelling, the, the zoo-fed animals that we were thinking could be a proxy for pre-industrial humans, or post-industrial humans, okay, is that they're eating zoo food, processed food. And then animals raised in the wild, again, bottle-fed, breastfed, and, and breastfeeding is a component of you know, the weaning process and everything. But look at the flatness and length of the palate, and these aren't age or sex match animals, but this palate can never recover. It could never become like that, okay? And this is a palate that can't accommodate a tongue that has to be, be back in the back of the throat. Now, I don't know if these animals snored, but the, the airway is smaller. This is where air comes in through your nose. So this was so compelling that we sort of put this on the back burner. We're, we're still going to continue with the chimpanzee study. They're 98.5 similar in genomically to humans. Um, but we're going straight to humans. And I've been invited to several museums all over the world to look at collections of old, older human skulls. This is a, a typical, what I see in my practice, a really deep cave of a pallet. Um, this is a 600-year-old skull from Italy of a child, you know, died in, died in childhood. But look at that palette. And that's, to, I can show you thousands and have skull after skull, but they all have these wide, broad, forward palettes that can, everything's forward, and they have big nasal airways. Um, so this is the conjecture that, you know, breastfeeding, everyone had to breastfeed pretty much before the Industrial Revolution. I mean, there, there's, there's bottle feeding throughout human history but that wasn't the norm. So we know everybody breastfed. It's a, it's a phenomenon. We know everybody was breastfed and, and weaned according to an ancestral pattern or a paleo pattern. Um, and everybody had wide jaws. So is there a relationship? And I'm going to propose in my hypothesis for my research, that, and it's testable, that, that it is. There is a relationship. Um, baby led weaning. Has everyone, anyone heard of baby led weaning? Okay, look it up, because you gotta know about this. If you're having kids, I've, I've talked to grandparents, parents today, to, uh, provide healthcare providers of kids, is that uh, baby led weaning is predicated on the fact that you let a baby, as soon as they can sit up on their own, to start to touch food. They get their pinching reflexes and uh, refined enough to pick up anything that they're gonna choke on. It's just not a realistic hazard, and you're gonna supervise them and be there with them. Let them lick food, touch food, hold a carrot, smell it, see it. If the first thing that a baby gets is a spoon of Gerber slop coming underneath their field of vision, they're going to think it's thick milk, and they're going to continue to suck. And their tongues will never go up into the roof of the mouth and develop it like an orthodontic expander. Okay, so that's really what my hypothesis is predicated on. The tongue, it's a muscle, and it opposes forces of the muscle of the face that want to pull everything in. Okay, um, who can breastfeed for three or four years? You know, and I'm a guy, and I, I right away, a lot of women say, who is this guy? You know, he's trying to, uh, and I'm not suggesting that, that we go back to that unless you want to and you can. We need to, with our technology, come up with an artificial breast. I mean, a real breast. These bottles, there isn't one good bottle on the market. And this is going online, and I hope that somebody sees it, because there's no good, bottle at all. They all suck in the face. So, okay, got to move along here. Um, they, they got feeders. Uh, here's another way to do it. You laugh, but, you know, somebody's going to invent that and make millions. Um, breastfeeding protects against a lot of things. ADD, uh, OSA, and um, I'm going to, I only got five minutes left. Did you say, oh my God. Yeah, okay. Um, well, anyway, breastfeeding, malocclusion is just the way the jaws and teeth line up. 
uh, and it didn't start to happen until about 300 years ago. Nobody had impacted wisdom teeth. Nobody. There's a few crooked teeth in Egyptian mummies, but they and they were nobility. Nobility had processed food. They had wet nurses. They didn't have the same commitment as a biological mother. Uh, Dan Lieberman was a Harvard anthropologist that was keynote last year, and he, he doesn't talk about infant feeding as much as I do. Class two malocclusion is what most bad bites are. The jaws are too far back, okay? And when the jaw is too far back, the airway back here is too far, it's, it's too narrow, okay? So the type of treatment that I do to help kids breathe better, it makes them look better too. Uh, we pull it, we widen them, and we help the jaw come forward. That helps the lower jaw, the upper jaw comes forward, and then the lower jaw can come forward, and that brings the, the tongue off the back, back of the throat. It widens the palate so the tongue will fit up here. This is what it looks like. Um, again, I wanted to show this, because this kid's three and a half, and he put in his own retainer, and he's totally proud. Everyone you know, says, oh, you can't do it, it's too much for a little kid, that's nonsense. I'm a pediatric dentist, I have a lot of training in, in behavior issues with kids. Orthodontists don't, uh, but they're gonna have to. Most kids are treated about eight or nine years old if they have ADD. Think of all the brain damage that could occur when an orthodontist is waiting for more teeth to come in. Uh, you know, this is a kid, and you, it's hard to see this, but his chest is caving in. He has a very little airway, his jaw's too far back, and we're currently keeping him off a CPAP or maybe even needing jaw surgery to bring his jaws forward or a tracheotomy. Um, I'm not gonna go into that, that's a little too technical, but the, the norms that orthodontists use are based upon post-industrial narrow-faced people. And they're not based on any sample size. It's subjective. A guy named Cecil Steiner in 1953 liked the way his daughter looked and made that the norm. And that's most analyses that orthodontists use now are based on that. So we're suggesting uh, that that needs to change. John Mew, many of you heard Mike Mew last year, the orthodontist from England who couldn't be here, but his dad came up with a what he calls a paleolithic profile. And this is what we treat all of our kids to. We bring them forward and it looks great. Uh, you know, this is a kid even who, a lot of people say his upper jaw is too far forward, obviously his lower jaw is too far back. The upper jaw, that dot should be ahead of that line. And that's what I found in, in all my prehistoric skulls. And the airway, if the jaw's forward, this airway can be big and they can breathe through their nose. Sometimes they have to be trained to do it because they've been breathing through their mouths all their life. Um, this is some of the skulls that I looked at, um, literally, thousands of skulls, and this part of the jaw, it's right under your nose, is always uh, ahead of the cranial base where, where we measure from. And that's conducive to, to healthy breathing. Okay, so these are just, you know, some renditions of what I see every day relative to, uh, you know, and there's still people, there's a genomic, uh, genetic component to this and diet, and I still got a lot of kids, they're real easy, I don't have to pull them forward very much, but. Almost every kid that comes to my office, I have to do a lot of bringing them forward and widening them. Are 70,000 years old. This is all, this is a, a, a modern day phenomenon. I say the Industrial Revolution did it because women, uh, they used to be in the home and their kids would be around them and they could wean them until they were three or four years old. Um, but who were the first skilled laborers in the Industrial Revolution? Women. And they could not stay at home with their kids, and that's when artificial feeding started, and that's when the impact of wisdom teeth started, and the malocclusion, and now we have epidemics of sleep apnea. This was shown um, by Jeffrey from New Mexico. Uh, of you know, these are these are basically Paleolithic faces. Pretty much everybody, and this is a book, Seven Daughters of Eve. Every Western European descends from one of seven women. Mitochondrial DNA has shown that. There's not that much variation genomically. So, you know, everybody can really accommodate all 32 of their teeth. I mean, it's, everyone needs two eyes in spite of the variation. Everyone needs 32, well, we don't need them, but we can accommodate them. It'll help us breathe better. We don't need them to choose. So, how how babies breathe. This is really important. It was previously life. thought that babies use a compression motion of the nipple to push milk out. But the new images show that babies extract milk by lowering their tongue to create a vacuum. 
The ability to produce a strong vacuum may See, the tongue and the nipple is pushing the face the forward and widening the jaw. The, 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 the jaw and the face is like the soft spots on a baby's head. The brain is growing the cranium, the tongue and the nipple in, in chewing with weaning to firm foods. Acts just like the brain growing the cranium. Everybody has the potential to accommodate all of their teeth and to have everything in a forward position. Uh, it's, it's just like the same way fontanelles work on the head. That's my hypothesis, and, and, and we, it is testable. Um, you have a suture, you know, lick the, rung, lick the roof of your mouth. You feel that line up there? That's your mid palatal suture. When you're a baby, if your tongue is going up and pushing the mom's nickel and, nipple and you're vacuuming the milk out, you're going to widen that, and then the tongue coming forward will work on this suture. This is called the incisive suture here, and it extends all the way up to the joint between your, your forehead and your nose. It brings the whole face forward. And as the tongue's coming forward, the jaw's coming forward and off the back of the throat, and it'll stay that way all their lives. This is the incisive suture. It comes all the way up, and that thing is so loose and so easily influenced. This, this is a bottle, you know, and this is an artificial they're showing how bottle feeding works. And you can see it doesn't push forward at all. It just rolls the nipple up on that, that line on the roof of your mouth. That will collapse the palate. It will undo. Breastfeeding, this, you know, breast milk is better than, than cow's formula based milk uh, formula, but, but delivering out of a bottle, don't do it. Just use a cup. We, we have high risk preemies in the neonatal and care unit that can lap up milk out of a cup. It's messier, it's not as easy, uh, but. Bottles and pacifiers and thumbs, they're, they're, they're really not helping at all. Uh, Pottinger's cats, he, he was the first one to postulate this, uh, comparing bottle feeding to breastfeeding. And what happens is, he said, the kids will just have that suck reflex all their life. Their tongue will never rest properly up into the roof of the mouth. Everybody right here, right now, your tongue should be, the whole tongue should be intimate with your palate. Okay? Paired structure, upper lip and lower lip, repaired. Upper, upper teeth and lower teeth, repaired structures. The paired structure for the roof of the mouth is not the floor of the mouth. It's what is attached to the floor of the mouth, the tongue. The tongue should be intimate with the palate all the time, especially in a child. And this is some of the work that shows, and this, these are data sheets from the work that we're doing in museums to show that this distance is always smaller than this distance in breastfed uh, kids, okay? In, in bottle-fed babies, they're the same. The faces are straight and flat. And you know, baby led weaning too. It's not just breastfeeding. Um, and this is an illustration of how the tongue, when it falls down, the muscles of the face will just over time pull things in. So how am I? I'm out of time now, aren't I? Right. Can I? Can I go? Okay. So here's how the tongue shapes the jaw. The tongue is a template for the. You you can see these lines all match up. This is exactly. Your teeth should be the same arc shape as your tongue. But people who are bottle fed, modern fed, their tongues are just down a little or some are down a lot. And that's the whole reason the orthodontic profession is a risk. It's just like dentistry is a function of sugar. I mean, dentistry isn't really making concerted efforts to make sugar go away. Uh, this is another thing that can keep the tongue off the roof of the mouth, tongue tie. Those things should be taken care of at birth. Uh, but we're even doing um, uh, phrenectomies, we call them, on adults. And they're breathing better, they're sleeping better. Sometimes it's just a restricted tongue that can be contributing to it. How soon can we pick this up? This is a kid we're following uh, in utero. Uh, and and this, is, you know, this is where he was toward the middle of the last trimester. Here he is at nine months old. And the mom comes all the way from Milwaukee. I'm in Chicago. That's a long drive. She brings four kids to me, and she wants me to follow him and get, you know, intervene as quickly as I can. So these are some of the things that happen. The deep, narrow palate, uh, the jaw that's too far back, can't close. Here's a kid whose tongue is just totally hanging out. Uh, some of the kids are going on CPAP already, open mouth breathing, um, and, and I can give you like five quick things. If a child snores, if a child grinds their teeth, if a child wants to bed, if a child sleeps in funny positions, if a baby sleeps on her belly with their butt up in the air, uh, night terrors, nightmares, waking up thirsty, 
kicking around a lot. Those are all indicators that that child is fighting to get oxygen to the brain while they sleep. And they are susceptible to ADD or you know some other, there's a whole continuum of neurological deficits. Um, we just published a chapter on this, Childhood Sleep Disorder Breathing and Dental Perspective in the most widely used pediatric medicine, sleep medicine textbook in the country. Uh, it's in press right now, but we've identified 30 components that a dentist can pick up, a school teacher can pick up, a school nurse can pick up, a grandma can pick up, anybody who works with kids, a caregiver, a professional. These are all things, and we need to get pediatricians doing this, we need to get dentists doing it, anybody who works with kids. I talked with a few people who have relatives and, and their kids, and they're being diagnosed with ADD, and getting ready to go on Ritalin maybe, um, there, there's another way. So anyway, um, you can't solve a problem. Einstein said, uh, you know, if you use the same kind of thinking. Paleo, evolutionary medicine, this is new thinking. Um, this was a, a nascent, uh, this was at Duke University that I was invited with six other dentists and 18 anthropologists from all over the world. Uh, to just go in a room and have and figure out how we can solve uh, the, the fact that nobody, you know, anthropologists aren't thinking in a clinical way and clinicians aren't thinking in an anthropological way. And it was it was published in the journal Science. Uh, so I think uh, remember sleep is not a luxury. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. And, Sorry. Uh, you can find them afterwards.